My personal definition of a smart contract is a credible commitment that's enforced in code. What a blockchain is doing is having all of these different computers, all of these different nodes running the same code, and it needs to come to the same conclusion because if the computers are all saying different things, then you don't really have the blockchain network anymore. Welcome to Building Tomorrow. I'm your regular host, Paul Matsko, uh, with me today in the studio. Uh, I'm Matthew Feeney, the director of Cato's project on emerging technologies. Uh, today we're going to be talking about smart contracts, and we've brought on a special guest uh, with some expertise in the area. Um, I'd like to welcome Kate Sills to the show. Uh, she came on Free Thoughts a couple of months ago um, to talk about smart contracts as well, kind of from a different perspective. Uh, Kate, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself, what you do? Sure. Uh, so for the past year or so, I've been researching smart contracts. Um, my background is in computer science. Um, I'm a software developer. I just recently started at uh, the startup Agoric. Um, and the co-founders have been working on secure smart contracts for probably about 30 years now. So congratulations! Uh, I'm so pleased to join you today. And thanks so much for inviting me. Yeah, well, we're excited to have you. Um, and I think I saw on your um, um, Medium bio that you also are a Tezos Commons board member. Right, that's correct. Yeah, Tezos, the Tezos Commons Foundation is a nonprofit in support of the Tezos blockchain, um, which uh, will be having a beta net very soon, and then a mainnet uh, launch after that. So that's also exciting. That is really that's really cool. Well, um, I think we might start at kind of uh, uh, ground zero here for our listeners who aren't incredibly familiar with smart contracts. I mean, they're probably familiar with the concept. They've heard it bandied about. But uh, could you start us off, Kate, by explaining what a smart contract is and what's the problem it's it's kind of devised to solve? Sure. So I think this is a very contentious term, so I'm just going to throw that out there. <laughs> um, but my personal definition of a smart contract is a credible commitment that's enforced in code. Um, and I can kind of try to break that down, but I think first off, it's very important to note that a smart contract doesn't necessarily have to be on a blockchain. And in fact, um, smart contracts predated blockchains. Uh, you know, the, they come from the early '90s, um, and there were they were in use um, even before the World Wide Web started. Uh, so there was an entity called Amex, the American Information Exchange. Um, that allowed people to buy and sell information, kind of like consulting time. Um, and that used a form of smart contracts. Um, but the problem that smart contracts are really trying to solve is what uh, legal scholar Anthony Cronman calls transactional insecurity. And this is something that goes back to Hobbes, uh, where it's, you know, uh, people want to make a deal, but once one side has carried out their part of the deal, the other side may renege on their promise. And this is what Oliver Williamson called opportunism. So that kind of like transactional insecurity has always been a problem and it's a problem on the internet. And so smart contracts are trying to solve that. Now, so traditional contracts, um, I suppose we should say traditional contracts instead of dumb contracts, <laughs> dumb versus smart. Traditional contracts, this is where you would go to court, right, to enforce the contract. If someone doesn't abide by the terms of the transaction, um, you take them to court or threaten to take them to court to force compliance. Um, and the idea here is that the the code in the smart contract, the kind of automatic enforcement, you know, obviates that need. You don't have to do that anymore. You don't have to go to court because the contract does what the contract's going to do as long as you know, the one party meets the, the terms of the transaction. I mean, am I getting that right? Is that the is that how the smart contract functions? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And I think that's a really important distinction because in the real world, in kind of the brick and mortar world, we can't have we can't just say here are the rules and then people automatically follow them. That's just not how people work. So we have to have this kind of ex post enforcement where if you break the rules, you get punished. But in code, in the computer world, uh, it's very different. You can actually just say to the computer program, like, here are the rules. And the computer, uh, being a dumb machine, will actually just follow those rules, uh, you know, presuming that you coded everything correctly. Um, so this is something that uh, Lawrence Lessig talked about in Code is Law, is kind of this, the internet and computers in general kind of open up this whole new world for 
um, constraints on human behavior, where if you if you write something in code, it just runs exactly as you coded it, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, so so it's not kind of this ex post uh, enforcement. It's actually enforcement just by running the code. And how how is this uh, better than what uh, we might call traditional contracts? If I wanted uh, to enter into a contract with Paul about you know, well, next week I promise that I'll sell you my car or something. Why would a smart contract be preferable to uh, what we've been used to? Sure, sure. So I think uh, just to to say first, I think there is a lot of hype. I think. Um, it's not necessarily true that at this point in time, smart contracts are even better than uh, legal contracts in a lot of ways. But I think people also have uh, an unrealistic perspective of legal contracts. Right now, the majority of the world doesn't have access to uh, court enforcement whatsoever. Uh, it's simply too expensive. Um, uh, legal scholar Jillian Hadfield has this number where I think it's under $100,000. It's just not worth, uh, worth going to court. And so access to justice is a very big deal. So I think we have to you know, make sure that we're comparing a realistic perspective of smart contracts with the realistic perspective of legal contracts. So, so that being said, I think uh, there are definitely some things that smart contracts can do better. So specifically in the area of uh, you have one stranger trying to make a transaction with another stranger across uh, legal jurisdictions. And that's something that up until now has mostly been limited to kind of multinational firms who can afford to figure out all of the, the legal uh, specificities and details that need to happen in order to actually make that transaction occur. Um, but something as simple as like a peer-to-peer -peer auction, kind of like an eBay model. Traditionally, it's been very hard to do. Uh, eBay has some uh, you know, reputation mechanisms that try to make that happen. But something like that is very, very simple to do in a smart contract. Um, and so, so I think you know, smart contracts are in their infancy. Um, they definitely need to be built out more. Um, there are a number of limitations. But when it comes to kind of the new economy that emerges on the internet and that I think we're starting to see now once we have a, a digital cash and cryptocurrencies, um, we're going to need that kind of very low transaction cost, stranger to stranger uh, transactional security that we haven't seen before. So what is the relationship between smart contracts and cryptocurrencies? Uh, at least uh, in, in some of the reading, uh, it's very common to read about Ethereum in particular. So, so what is Ethereum and what's its relationship to smart contracts? Sure. So so uh, again, smart contracts, you know, have been around since the early '90s. So they predate blockchains. But uh, what blockchains were able to provide the world was a way of solving the double spin problem. So this was a way of uh, giving the world digital cash that they could actually, uh, you know, uh, transact with on the internet in a way that didn't require a central authority. And so that kind of it was like, okay, well now we have the cash. We can send we can send money to people. But if we're actually trying to, you know, pay someone for an item in kind of that peer-to-peer -peer market, we need to have some way of ensuring that I don't send them the money, and you know, they never send me the item, that sort of thing. Um, so, what's interesting is that the kind of pseudo-anonymous founder of Bitcoin was very interested in in these sorts of exchanges. Uh, there's opcodes, so that's kind of like the very low-level uh, uh, commands in the Bitcoin script that are for uh, escrow and kind of smart contracting and other kind of more, plex, more complex tasks. Um, but uh, Bitcoin itself doesn't really support a lot of those. They're kind of put in there in anticipation of the future. Um, and so what people were looking for um, in Ethereum was a way to do more complex transactions, um, to have you know, more clauses, um, uh, more cases, um, and, and just be able to handle a lot more complexity. So that's why you would want a more Turing complete language. Um, and, and so from there, there's kind of been this explosion of, oh, okay, we can do smart contracts on a blockchain and we can use uh, cryptocurrencies as part of that transaction. Um, because if we were trying to use cash, then we would have to you know, still go back to, uh, you know, well, how are we having 
U.S. dollars on the internet, who's actually backing that? You know, who's promising that there's U.S. dollars behind that? Um, so what cryptocurrencies allow us to do is to include some kind of payment in transactions that we know exists and we're not depending on a, a central authority for. So well, what I hear is, uh, and to put this in kind of layman's terms, um, uh, the smart contract is doing two kind of essential things. Uh, first of all, it solves the problem of escrow. Like when you talk about U.S. dollars, right now somebody has to hold the, the, those U.S. dollars, a third party, um, such that the you know say you're on eBay and you want to buy a, 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 a widget. The widget costs however many dollars. There's someone with a widget who's willing to part for that many dollars, but the widget has to change hands non-instantaneously, has to go through the mail. And so in theory, you're supposed to get the payment and send the widget, but there's that period of uncertainty. So eBay hold, or you know PayPal, or so, they hold on to the money in escrow um, to make sure that both parties, you know, the person who bought the widget gets the widget and the person that sold the widget gets the money. Um, the um, you know whether it's Ethereum or something else that basically crypto, um, ob you know, gets rid of that need for escrow because it's there on the blockchain. It, it, you know, it's it's decentralized. There's no need for a centralized uh, escrow party. Um, and then the other bit is that self-enforcing, right? You don't have to, in theory, you don't have to rely on the courts to um, adjudicate the situation. So it's like a self-enforcing contract, and it takes care of the escrow problem. Um, is that a fair way of kind of characterizing what's going on there? Yeah, I think so. It's definitely self-enforcing, and I think uh, even a lot of smart contracts will include escrow. Um, but the important thing is that um, no one is in charge of the escrow. It's uh, it's only the smart contract. So that part is self-enforcing as well, um, which is nice because you know then you don't have to depend on a third party to hold your money, especially if it's a large right. amount. Okay. Yeah, um, that, that makes sense. Um, and I was thinking, uh, in response to what you were saying about the potential benefits of a smart contract and, and the, the fact that with traditional contracts, uh, especially folks who don't have lots of money, who aren't large corporations, who are not middle or upper class, don't really have access to, to contract disputes just because of the sheer cost of hiring a lawyer, the cost of going to court. Um, I was thinking of uh, rental situations. Often when I read about smart contracts, I hear folks give the example of a landlord having a, like a lockbox on their house and uh, you know they, they do a smart contract with a potential renter who in exchange for um, you know in exchange for payment, they get access to the lockbox or access to the like a digital lock on the door. If they don't pay, the, the door locks, the door won't open. and there's this um, uh, but there's some recourse there as well, which like currently if you have a rental dispute, it's very rare if someone doesn't pay their rent, the landlord is basically stuck with the bill for, depending on the state, for up to a you know up to six months or a year. Um, it's often not worth it for the landlord to go through the court proceedings that are required to evict a renter. Um, it's just too expensive, too much of a bother, too much of a pain. So you have this whole area that goes actually under litigated in a sense. Um, that in theory a smart track a smart contract could provide an alternative uh, a resolution. Um, so I think that's quite intriguing. I mean, what other areas do you see the potential applications um, for smart contracts? Um, some of the like the more like where you see this going in the immediate future, like the areas where you think that will benefit right now from smart contract uh, adoption. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah. So I think I, I think. Um kind of the eBay model of transactions over the internet um, is, a, is a really big use case simply because um, you know, most of those transactions are quite small and you know, aren't covered by our traditional contracting system. Um, let's see, I think some other examples, uh, so you had mentioned rental situations. Um, I think in the future, it might be possible to actually have property title on a blockchain uh, if the, the legal jurisdiction in the area agrees to that. And then um, from there, as long as you have um, a token representing the title to a property, you can use smart contracts to uh, securely transfer those. And so um, 
there you, you leave out a lot of the ambiguity that today we rely on title insurance and, you know, a whole army of people to try to figure out. Uh, whereas, you know, if you, if you're able to show, I have ownership of this token, um, it makes this in the situation a lot easier. Um, there's still a lot of problems to be worked out there in terms of, you know, um, is the, the legal entity that's kind of issuing all these tokens, have they resolved uh, any disputes in terms of ownership before they actually issue the tokens and that sort of thing. Um, so, so there's still a lot, I think, to resolve there. Um, let's see, some other examples that I'm thinking of um, that mostly have to do with moving something that's in the real world onto the blockchain and then enforcing secure transfer of those. Um, so, but we can also see that there might be, uh, you know, things maybe like sell, buying and selling event tickets, things that might actually be created, um, that, that are kind of created property in a way that can be bought and sold. Um, you know, there's, there, in, in the contracting world, there's a lot of different contracts, right? We might have, there's marriage contact contracts, there's employment contracts, um, there's a lot of different things. Um, but I think what smart contracts are really great at is this kind of solving the transactional insecurity problem, um, especially with internet transactions. So I suppose this might not actually be a question so much about smart contracts, but about the role of the legal systems we're used to in a world where smart contracts are used. So, so go, going back to the example of, I promise to uh, sell Paul a car, and we organize this this agreement using a smart contract. And then uh, on the day of uh, the sale, the funds get transferred and the car unlocks uh, automatically after the contract is executed. And then Paul gets into the car and it turns out that I've sold him a defective car. It's not the car that was advertised. Yeah, and uh, the, the, the tires are flat or the brakes don't work, something like that. Uh, in, in this world in which smart contracts are ubiquitous, I suppose, do we still have a court that Paul could walk into? Or uh, is there something else that could potentially be used? Yeah. So I think uh, it could be possible that we still have uh, court enforcement of things like that. But I think something else that's really promising is uh, the combination of smart contracts with private arbitration. So it might be that um, uh, most of the contract is simply enforced in code. But we leave open the possibility that if there is a dispute in that contract, um, that it goes to a predetermined uh, a private arbitration agency um, that we've given the authority to decide certain things. So uh, the really cool thing here is that unlike um, a legal contract where you know we're not quite sure what the, the you know the court might decide at the end of it, um, we we can limit the discretion and the authority that's given to private arbitration to say, you know, here are the possible outcomes that we want you to decide. You can only decide among these outcomes, and then we'll take whatever you give us, whatever answer you give us, and then put that into the smart contract. Um, so, so I think it, what it does is that it actually uh, severely limits the authority that you're handing over and allows you to have more um, uh, just just more predictability in what the, the total outcome of the contract is going to be. So I guess uh, one possibility would be that uh, this dispute arises and we think, well, we both know Kate and she's smart and we both trust her. She can uh, sort this out. Uh, that's, that's one model. But uh, I, I worry about, well, if, if there are... If some of these end up in court, why would a court treat these kind of agreements as anything different to an online chat, right? Like they're just looking at um, a piece of computer code and trying to figure out why why should that uh, be any more important or legitimate than uh, Paul and I just trading emails about the car. Well, and we it's it's uh, I'm thinking about this after you know the embarrassment of. Uh, various elderly senators trying to understand how Facebook works right. during the yeah. Cambridge Analytica hearings, where you know it, we're talking about judges who are probably going to skew older, um, who are going to be more likely to be tech illiterate, trying to suss out the whys and wherewithals of code, right? Of of I mean, they don't even know what the blockchain is, let alone uh, how a smart contract works. Um, so, I mean. What it sounds like, Kate, is that um, this reminds me of a proposal that uh, Alex uh, Tabarrok 
made for in a piece for a marginal revolution uh, towards international courts for smart contract arbitration, um, where he he basically points out, look, there's this long history of private um, arbitration between between you know between private parties um, that's extrajudicial, that's outside of the formal. Um, state court system. I mean, he he goes all the way back to like he makes a reference to Lex Mercatoria, like the medieval Middle Ages, and like merchants who had an arb- like this complex arbitration system that was like court like, but not officially part of, and uh, you know the the legal system uh, that arguably was a lot better than the legal system of the time. A lot, um, and proposes a Lex Cryptographia. Um, so, I mean, I, I suppose you could build this into a smart cr- contract system where people say part of this smart contract is if we have a disagreement in how this – in those ambiguities, if I sold Matthew uh, a lemon, um, you know, a, a squirrel had died in the exhaust and now the car stank and he didn't know that until he climbed in, um, written into the contract is that like the court of first appeal would be – this kind of you know would be this lex cryptographia would be this private arbitration system um, that would resolve you know, I don't know some large percentage of these disagreements. Um, you could probably write that into the contract itself. I mean, have you have you heard proposals other than uh, Tabarox um, as you've you know as people have been writing about this space, Kate? Yeah, yeah. So so the law merchant. Um... And using that as kind of the framework for these uh, cross-jurisdictional uh, dispute resolution frameworks um, has been something that I've been arguing for quite a long time. Um, and this is actually happening in the blockchain space. So there are companies like uh, Claros and I think Sagewise as well. Um, and I believe there's another one called Juris that have noticed that you know smart contracts are going to need some kind of dispute resolution system. Um, and they're trying to provide that. So um, some of those white papers are, are really, really fantastic works in, I think, uh, law and economics and uh, computer science. So I, I'm, I'm very excited about those. But, but I think it's a really, really good point that, um, you know, this idea that uh, we don't necessarily need the courts for enforcement, that we can have uh, private arbitration, it's not a new idea. Uh, you know, private arbitration is used all the time in commercial settings. Um, and it goes back all the way to medieval times where the merchant class wanted to be able to resolve their disputes very quickly. They didn't want to have to go to, you know, the uh, local feudal lord or the ecclesiastical courts uh, because those might be far away when they're traveling for business. And they probably don't even understand what the contract is about because they're not business savvy. So the law merchant uh, allowed them to choose um, uh, arbitration entities that you know were were people that were businessmen who understood where they were coming from and uh, you know had a similar interest in trying to resolve disputes very quickly. So maybe it might take an hour versus like uh, you know months or years or weeks. Um, so, so I think that's a great model for for the kind of thing that we need for smart contracts on the internet. If if we're using smart contracts on the blockchain and uh, we use a, a, a currency like uh, Ethereum, there's a, a, a large amount of security that's the responsibility of the owner of those tokens, right? Uh, and what what happens if I lose my key in 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 this this kind of in this world? Right, right. So that's something that's been really widely discussed uh, because the kind of the the experimental frameworks that are out there uh, haven't really covered this part of it. They don't really cover kind of like the user experience and the user interface aspects uh, really at all, which is unfortunate. But I think that's just a matter of how early it is. Um, so I, I think there's a couple of things that could be done there. Um, one is having, you know, uh, better software on the front end. So allowing users to, you know, not just have to use the command line or, you know, have to store all of this stuff, but figure it all out themselves, but rather having software that kind of assists them and, you know, um, in that. Another is having uh, third parties kind of like Coinbase hold some of that, uh, you know, secret information for them and manage it for them. Um, But I think one thing that's really intriguing is the possibility of having, 
governance for the entire blockchain. And this is something that Tezos and others have been looking into. And that governance uh, could in the future include some of that kind of um, very low level blockchain specific dispute resolution, where it's not necessarily that uh, you have a dispute in a smart contract, but that you actually need some kind of uh, assistance on the blockchain level itself. You've lost your private keys. Uh, you know, you you had uh, in the case of property title on a blockchain. Um, you know, you would need to be able to go to whoever had issued that property title and say, "Hey, I'm I'm the rightful owner still. I just don't have the key anymore." Um, so that's something that people are still working out. Um, it's not there's no in, intrinsic problem that makes it, uh, you know, unsolvable or intractable. It's mostly just that people have been like, well, we really need to kind of like figure out the consensus mechanisms and the infrastructure for this world. And we can worry about the, you know, the small user interface problems later. And so I think that's kind of where we are in the building process. I mean, it's kind of a, a non-unique harm in a sense where like currently I'm trying to sell my car, uh, What's the first thing you do? You go and dig around in your paperwork and hope that you kept the car title somewhere because you don't want to keep it in your car, um, right? And then you're like, oh, crap, last time I moved, uh, it got put in the wrong files. Now I don't know where the car title is. And like, oh, this is a pain. I have to go see where I registered it, you know, and go down to some state authority and find out, right? Like th this is currently a problem with losing title, losing access, and you end up being thrown to like – in a sense, to a third party who's holding that information for you. So just as that is solvable, so too, in theory, is this solvable? Um, and at least potentially, it could be solvable in a way that's um, uh, slipperier, that that's, has less friction to it, and is less of a pain than going to the you know, auto registration office and hearing a bored bureaucrat uh, give you a hard time for losing your title. Um, and then paying to have it reissued and the like. Uh, something else I wanted to to touch on, Kate, um, and f for our listeners, this will make you sound really smart if you bring this up in a conversation about smart contracts at your next uh, cocktail party. Um, uh, I'm referencing your article by uh, Jimmy Song from Medium, The Truth About Smart Contracts. And he's very, very bearish on the potential for smart contracts. Um, and really, I mean, he's echoing a lot of the kind of cautions that you yourself have issued here, which is like, look, there's still stuff being worked out. This is, you know, still a, a you know, work in progress. Um, but he mentions in the piece, he spends a great deal of time talking about the Oracle problem, which is a riff off of the Oracle of Delphi. Um, uh, which was a real historical, like, um, you know, ancient Greece. And if you wanted knowledge of the future, you're supposed to go to the Oracle, pay a fee. And uh, it, kind of like the movie 300. She was ingesting volcanic fumes or something. Yes. Right? It's not, yeah, not a wise old person. Right, right. Yeah. Well, and then in theory, people, you know, it was really her utterings were interpreted by a body. Three hundred is a very loose and and uh, dramatic and titillating uh, interpretation. It's a horrible um, movie. Yeah, yeah, it's bad for a whole bunch of reasons. So there you go. Sometime we can uh, talk about technology and movies. Um, so so the Oracle problem. What is that? What is Song talking about? And I, I think we've kind of danced around it a bit in our conversation so far. But can you flesh that out for our audience, Kate? Sure. So um, it comes from a certain characteristic of code that runs on a blockchain. So anything that runs on a blockchain has to be deterministic, uh, which just means that uh, if you put in the same inputs, you need to get the same outputs every time. So you know, if I have a, a function, you can just think of it as like a mathematical function, and you know I put the number one in and I get two out, uh, then when I try that again and I put one in again, I should also get to the next time. So, so it, it needs to be deterministic because uh, what a blockchain is doing is having all of these different computers, all of these different nodes running the same code, and it needs to come to the same conclusion because if the computers are all saying different things, then you don't really have the blockchain network anymore. Um, so, so code that runs on a blockchain needs to be deterministic. And so that means that uh, a smart contract, when it's trying to look for information, like let's say uh, we have a bet on um, the outcome of an NBA game or something like that, it can't go to NBA.com and pull down the info, the score of the game. Um, because I, I think, you know, this has happened to all of us. We go to a, uh, you know, link on 
uh, a website and it turns out that the website is no longer there or, you know, something has changed that it's broken. Um, and so we can't, uh, code that runs on a blockchain can't kind of reach out into the real world and pull in information. But so, so that is definitely a problem and a limitation, but there's an easy solution to that, which is to have entities that write this kind of information to the blockchain so that it's completely deterministic and the code on the blockchain can read it. Um, and those entities are called oracles. Um, so, so the Oracle problem, and I, I think this is what uh, Jimmy Song is referring to, is that uh, you know you have entities that write code to the blockchain, but the blockchain is supposed to be minimizing trust. So then, you know, uh, what are we to think of these trusted entities uh, that are writing code or writing uh, the results, writing information to the blockchain? Um, so I, I think. It, this, you know, is a concern. Uh, we need to make sure that whatever we're re relying on for our information is actually trustworthy. Um, but I think it's it's really a mistake, and it's really um, a mistake in terms of thinking of what uh, uh, blockchains are for. They're not in trying to get rid of trust entirely. It's it's supposed to minimize trust. It's it's uh, risk management. You know, you can never get the risk down to zero but you can try to limit it and limit the authority that you're granting to other people. Um, so there are different ways that you can try to kind of combat this problem. Instead of just relying on one entity, you could rely on a, a lot and then kind of average them or you know, otherwise combine the answers so that if one of them um, is corrupted somehow, you know, you're, you're not, uh, you, you don't have a problem. Um, there are other things that you can do. So, if you think that uh, your threat model is that um, someone's going to try to bribe whoever is giving this answer, then you might uh, just have a pool of a million people and select one of them randomly and ask them, hey, can you look at NBA.com and tell me the score? And then that way it's very hard to um, to bribe someone ahead of time um, because you, you know the attacker doesn't actually know who it's going to be. And whoever is selected is probably not very interested in the outcome of your smart contract. Um, so that sort of model kind of solves what Jimmy Song is referring to as the Oracle problem. This is a uh, very William F. Buckley-esque in a way where he, where he said, um, I would rather be governed by someone chosen out of the phone book than you know, a graduate of Harvard. I'm, I'm, I'm riffing on that. There, there's a sense here where it's like, the wisdom of the of the crowd, the wisdom of the median person. But it's it's also though not necessarily wisdom of the crowds. It seems to be it's wisdom of people who are interested or motivated to be involved. So if if I get in a fight with you about I don't know who the Pope was in 1710, right? We can just whip out our phones and we'll probably go to Wikipedia, which isn't anyone we know. It's just uh, curated by people who do care about who the Pope was in 1710, uh, and we can. Be fairly, you know, we can check the logs and see editing, but uh, it's it's considered fairly reliable, right? Because it's entirely built around uh, by a community of people who care about what's going on, without caring about whether Matthew's right or Paul's right. Yeah. Well, and then here's the recourse to um, the recourse to arbitration system. So in those that small percentage of cases um, where it's actually not accurate, where Wikipedia, you know, was you know some malicious editor put something false on there or just got it wrong. I mean, I have to note that as as a as a former history teacher, um, I would have docked someone's paper if they, if they put in the footnotes Wikipedia, right? But yeah, it's good for bar fights. But it's good it's great Sorry. for it's great for a bar bets uh um or in you know in the case I'm trying to imagine now that uh sports betting is nationally legal uh, online, right? Um or or could be depending on how states rule uh, individually, but you know, imagine the end of a football game. Uh, NFL.com records that a touchdown was caught, but then the the referees decide to review it, and after you know a five minute delay, they reverse that call. Like everyone's always got a lot on the line in that moment. But imagine if your smart contract automatically enforced when the six points went up, you know, meaning that you met the you met the bet, right? Um, you met the over under. And then suddenly, oh, 
it's reversed, but too late, the contract executed. But again, for those, that's not a super frequent happening. That's something that happens in a very small percentage of cases, uh, Wikipedia being wrong, right? A small percentage of cases, that's the point of this private arbitration system is for dealing with that less than 1% of um, situations where something messes up. Um, I, th I thought it was interesting, Kate, when you talked about um, trust and smart contracts, smart contracts as a way of minimizing trust. Um, I, I think in my own head, um, I don't think of smart contracts as a means of eliminating trust or I mean like in an idealized world where you could make a completely trustless smart contract. I actually don't know if that's the goal. It's almost as if there are some contexts in which um, making certain things less ambiguous um, will actually allow you to build more trust on the things that need to remain ambiguous, right? That like making some stuff ironclad means that other things can be, you can trust people more on. You don't have to kind of like spread the trust around. Um, I was thinking here of, of, well, I mean, the counter argument would be what I call the, the prenup effect, you know, the prenup agreement for a marriage. Um, all the social science data shows that when you sign a prenup, the moment you sign it, you are significantly more likely to get a divorce. So ironically, making something in that marriage contract more ironclad, less ambiguous, uh, more specific, actually decreases the amount of trust in the relationship. So sometimes like something, making something less ambiguous can actually undermine trust, but at the same time, we sign a marriage contract as a means of building trust. Um, so. I, I'd like to hear a little more about that. Like, where do you see? I mean, where do you see that balance between smart contracts as a means of of decreasing the amount of trust required in a contract, and smart contracts as a way of actually building trust between the participants by decreasing ambiguity? Sure. Yeah. So, like I said, I think there are a number of different contracts, um, and they're they're all used in different situations. So. You know, in the case of a marriage, um, it's not like you're making a contract with a stranger, right? You hopefully have had a very long relationship with this person and you trust them. Um, <laughs> um, so, so I think you know, um, definitely human psychology comes into play where you know you have this person that you want to spend the rest of your life with in that situation, and then all of a sudden you're putting in terms that kind of turn into an arm's length business transaction, and uh, so so there's you know, um, I think that itself is probably very disturbing to people is that kind of that, uh, uh, transition from what would be a non-transactional relationship into a transactional relationship. Um, but, but I think, you know, again, what I see the use of smart contracts for is kind of not necessarily these, these, uh, contracts that deal with already existing relationships, but rather uh, people who are interacting, who have no other information about the other person and are trying to do business through the internet. Um, so I, I think that's really the, the primary use case for smart contracts is not to take a real life relationship and turn it into a business transaction, but to enable business transactions that would have never have happened uh, without a smart contract. So it's kind of similar to, um, what economists will say about the market in general. You know, it's not that we want to, you know, have parents, uh, you know, buying and selling things with their kids or something like that. Like, you know, there's, uh, we're not trying to replace uh, human relationships. It's that the market allows us to, uh, you know, uh, produce um, welfare for people that we wouldn't otherwise care about, uh, you know, that live on the other side of the world and we're actually enriching their lives. Uh, through business transactions that wouldn't have happened without a secure marketplace and secure transactions. It, it, to use uh, uh, Thomas Haskell, uh, Haskell's formation, he he talks about like market capitalism more generally as a like a technology of an idea. Um, it expands the circle of who is my neighbor. So it's not as much about deepening already existing relationships in your village or in your country. It's about expanding the circle of who you'll have. A relationship with you know, now because of market capitalism, a, um, a a merchant in Edinburgh in Scotland can have a relationship with a merchant in Bombay, and have some expectation of of that relationship actually you know 
binding the two together in a way that wasn't true in kind of a pre-market or as true in a pre-market era. So it's about like widening the pool rather than deepening the pool in a sense. And, and that, that's how I think uh, I'd apply it here. Um, well, we're running out of time here. Um, I, I think if I had to sum up one of the, the interesting themes that's run throughout would be that, Kate, you've been pointing on that there's kind of nothing new under the sun, that smart contracts are not this you know last couple of years product of of cryptocurrency and the blockchain that they predate it, they they go back to the early 90s. That the idea of uh, independent arbitration courts are older; they go back to the Middle Ages, as as Tabarrok pointed out. Um, that and, and thus, I mean, I think that tempers our expectations here, where we say, look, this is an old; these are old forms that are being enabled to be used in new ways because of new technology. And I think that's a I think that's a valuable insight. So, uh, Kate, thank you for coming on. Thank you for talking about smart contracts with us. Appreciate your time. And uh, listeners, uh, we'll uh, talk to you next week on Building Tomorrow. Building Tomorrow is produced by Tess Terrible. If you enjoy our show, please rate, review, and subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. To learn about Building Tomorrow or to discover other great podcasts, visit us on the web at libertarianism.org.